All right, so um, this is uh, this is work. So I don't know if any if you know there's people here that are new. Um, so I'm Victor Chonka. I'm uh, I'm an assistant lecturer uh, in the computer science department. I'm in C one three one, so just at the entrance of the C corridor. Uh, my background is in uh, networks, wireless networks, a lot of work with uh, embedded devices, and now I'm interested in more powerful networks in high data rate and so on. Um, this this what I'll be presenting today is work that um, uh, myself and uh, and my team we are doing as part of the uh, Confirm uh, Center for uh, Smart uh, Manufacturing. So it's an SFI center. Uh, so this is this is the team. So you know none of the stuff that I will be presenting here is work that I am doing myself. Okay, so I'm just taking credit for other people's work. Um, uh, so we've got Yasanta. So he's uh, so Yasanta and Tabinda are PhD students. So Yasanta started in 2019. So this is his final year. Uh, Tabinda had just uh, joined us in January. Um, we've got Alvaro, who I think is on the call. So he's he's a postdoc. He started in uh, he started last year, uh, and then myself. Um, so um, we are looking at, uh, so obviously because the Confirm Center is looking at uh, smart manufacturing, we are looking at um, uh, wireless communication for, uh, for these kind of environments, for industrial, uh, for industrial networks, industrial environments. And um, uh, you know, there's a lot of networking and a lot of communication. You've got sensors and actuators and all kinds of devices that have to communicate. Uh, between themselves, you've got you know central controllers, SCADA systems, you know data collection, monitoring, um, uh, and then of course you've got you know the bigger you know communication between buildings, warehouses, and so on. So everything is everything is connected, even um, even in industrial um, environments. Um, the what makes industrial applications so uh, you know particular uh, and you know special compared to other types of you know networking applications is the the constraints right so uh, you know everything especially when you're talking about um factory automation discrete automation so you know this would be a pipeline of things that is that is moving and robots you know the robotic arms that are moving at speed and lifting big cars and you know spray painting them and fixing the doors everything has to happen at uh at high speed it has to happen and with high precision yeah so the timing has to be very well controlled and also the, the accuracy has to be very well controlled as well. Um, so, so usually what we're talking about in terms of uh, reliability, for example, right? It's, it's about what is tolerated is about one uh, erroneous packet in, in a billion, okay? So this, this is extremely high you know, reliability that is, being, that is being required. And also then we're talking about the response time, okay? So you've got, uh, you know, um, a controller issues a command, and then you know some devices in the uh, in the factory need to respond with uh, you know with sensor values or with you know acknowledgements and so on. And and here we're talking anything from uh, you know uh, a few ten tens of milliseconds down to uh, a few tens of microseconds. Okay, so this is very uh, very tight uh, response times that we need to uh, that we need to accommodate. Um, but the most important thing is uh, to have a deterministic, uh, deterministic communication channel. Okay, so because all the um, so developing control loops and uh, control algorithms uh, on top of a communication channel requires guarantees, right, of, of the transmission of information. So um, um, you know it's very important that you can say you know. For example, with 95% uh, certainty, we will have less than 10 milliseconds uh, latency. Okay, uh, so in other words, we have to control the the, the jitter, um, and uh, this is a problem for for wireless. Now, why do we actually need wireless? Well, because I mean, you know, at the moment, most most of the industrial environments they're using wired networks. But wireless obviously is required for, you know, at the most basic for mobility, right? So we have more and more robots. Uh, I mean, you know, surely uh, you've seen the um, Boston Dynamics videos and they had that video with the, uh, the two robots that were working in a warehouse. Um, uh, you know, so whenever we have uh, robots, you need to have wireless communication. It would be cumbersome to have them connected by wires. Um, but then there's other things as well, right? So modern manufacturing is moving more towards a uh, configurable, distributed um, 
um, let's say um, setup, right? Where instead of having like a uh, monolithic manufacturing pipeline where that is, you know, pre-designed to do a certain thing, it's actually nowadays it, uh, the, t the tendency and the goals are to make these smaller and uh, modular so that you, you can interconnect them to, to create exactly what you want to have, okay? So obviously, because these things are, are more modular, they are more configurable, they are more mobile as well. So definitely there's, there's scope for moving to wireless communication and um, eliminating the cumbersome uh, wires. Now, uh, we all know the limitations of wireless, right? So, um, you know, uh, we know that at home, as you've got more and more neighbors, the, the wireless uh, connection starts um, worsening. Um, and, you know, you need to go tweak your router and change the channels and so on, so that uh, you can find something that is not very, uh, very busy. Um, but even at its at its most basic, wireless is um, inherently less reliable than wired because, right? In in a wired environment, you have the cable conduit that basically isolates you from any external interference, and also it um, directs all the power of the signal through the cable, right? But when we're using wireless, the power is actually, you know, in most cases, dissipated all around. Uh, so you only get a portion of that uh, of that signal power, and also, you know, in some cases the signal bounces bounces off of uh, different obstacles and reflects, um, and then you get copies, multiple copies of the signal that that are coming, uh, you know, overlapping, and then you know they might cause the signal to to decrease in power and so on and so forth, right? So so there's an inherent uh, non-determinism when it comes to wireless communication, and you know what we're trying to do is to make this. Um, behave and to make it deterministic. So in an industrial environment, uh, you know, so the ones that we're targeting are looking like this, okay? So there's lots of, um, lots of um, robotic equipment, lots of metallic equipment. Uh, some, of these equi some of this equipment is moving at speed. Um, and, you know, if you're trying to find a clean path between two devices, it's very difficult and it's very likely that it will be uh, closed by 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 some some devices moving, and then you know obviously as the signal starts bouncing off everywhere, it's absolute madness to try and um, you know predict what will happen with your um, communication. So you know there have been of course uh, attempts to use wireless communication in industrial environments. So you know you could classify them in two sections: low power communication, low power low data rate, and then high high power high data rate and the two of them solve two different purposes. So the low power, low data rate is very good for uh, for monitoring. Okay, so there are two there are two solutions: wireless heart and ISA 111A. So these are communication standards. So um, these are uh, you know they have even been used in the GSK plant here in Cork, somewhere in the late uh, noughties. Um, now the thing is because they are low data rate, they are you know they are not considered to be reliable, so then they are kind of kept away from critical processes. But if you have a plant where you know it's um, distributed over a large area, then you can use these devices to actually monitor the different, uh, let's say the different, uh, uh, let's say uh, silos or something um, within within the the industrial park. Okay, without actually having to send some person there. So for that reason, it's good. And then we, we get to these high data rate, high power uh, solutions such as, um, you know, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, okay? And these actually can get to very high data rates, okay? To, they can get to gigabits per second. So in theory, they can meet the latency constraints, right? So they could actually uh, have meet cycle times in the microseconds, okay? But the problem is that Wi-Fi and Bluetooth out of the box rely on random channel access, okay? Because they're designed to be consumer um, communication technologies, okay? Where you don't know exactly how many consumers are going to try to connect. So they rely on randomness, okay? To try to, um, uh, try to um, uh, sequen sequ sequ sequence the, the access of the different uh, clients to the, uh, to the network, okay? So this relying on randomness makes them non-deterministic, okay? But then there are some standards, okay, that actually have taken the physical layers, so the high data rates of the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, 
and have put on top of them a deterministic uh, medium access control protocol. Okay, so so that uh, enables them to be deterministic. And also we have the 5G bandwagon, okay, which everyone is um, uh, is trying to get uh, get onto. Um, and why is this attractive for industry? Well, there's a few things. First of all, there's the increased data rate. So with the use of millimeter wave uh, frequency bands, you can get to gigabits per second. Um, 5G is, uh, is inherently deterministic. So it relies on deterministic protocols to manage the access to the network because mobile networks need to be deterministic. Okay, otherwise our communications and our calls would just drop in, uh, uh, in, mid, um, uh, in mid call. Um, but then 5G brings a few other things, okay? So it brings this network slicing thing, which is another uh, hype term, and there's been a lot of research done here, which is basically the ability to slice the network and provide guarantees on each network slice. And then it also brings uh, the concept of ultra-reliable low-latency communication, which is very handy for any industrial application that requires ultra-reliability and low-latency, just as I was uh, talking about before. And then it also brings the ability to construct private mobile networks, okay? So no longer do you have to rely on uh, on three or on Vodafone to manage your, uh, you know, the network that you might deploy in your industrial uh, park, but you can actually deploy your own solution, okay? So that's, that's something that is permitted. So, you know, 5G actually has these solutions and it's actually very attractive. Now, for example, URLLC is something that is just uh, is still a research problem, okay? So the 5G standards are just working on URLLC at the moment, okay? Whereas, for example, network slicing kind of uh, is uh, supported by the, uh, by the standards, okay? So, you know, it's still a work in, uh, in, in progress. So considering all that I've said so far, right, and the state, of, um, the state of things, you know, you may be wondering why we are actually doing research because it kind of seems, you know, that 5G is providing determinism and ultra-reliable low-latency communication and Wi-Fi has the high data rates and it's deterministic. So what are we doing here, right? Well, you know, there are still some things that haven't been solved, right? So for example, reaching that uh, one per billion packet error is still an issue, okay? So uh, at the moment there's, uh, the solutions are still, still struggling to get to that, um, um, to those values. But then what's more important is that the um, uh, communication environments are actually highly dynamic and uh, highly um, uh, stochastic. So then, you know, even if you have a communication system that is very robust, if you have an obstacle that blocks your, um, you know, that blocks your, your communication, then your communication will actually stop, right? So whether you actually, you can have the most robust communication system, but if something is blocking the communication, then it won't happen, okay? It's just like someone cutting the, uh, the ethernet cable, okay? So, so this, is, this is a problem, okay? And, you know, most communication uh, channels are modeled stochastically, and, you know, there is some probability that they will have a certain amount of blockage or outage, okay, where communication is not possible. So we need to try, so one of the things we're trying is to find a way to deal with this um, uh, highly dynamic and unpredictable channels, okay? And finally, of course, you know, we always want to uh, take it to the next level, okay? So we always want to push the throughput even, uh, even higher, minimize the power consumption, and so on and so forth. So uh, the approach that we have in this in this project is kind of like of um, it, it's an approach of dynamic um, uh, dynamic um, dynamically optimized communication system. Okay, so we've got um, we are addressing the reliability of the communication with three different uh, classes of techniques. So first of all, we are uh, addressing it by designing more um, uh, robust communication uh, mediums, okay? Um, more robust radios, okay? By improving the way the information is encoded in a more robust way, the information is modulated. Um, another thing that we are doing is we're looking at spatial diversity, okay? So here, instead of using a single, a single link between two devices, we're trying to use different different options at the same time so this is what it's known as spatial diversity so uh, so with this we're hoping to actually be able to go around these kind of link blockages that are unpredictable and then we have we you know we have a mac protocol that is able to manage these kind of um, uh, these kind of techniques and provide synchronous and deterministic uh, uh, communication um, and the important thing is that all of these three um, um, technologies would be 
dynamically configurable, dynamically tunable, uh, based on the communication conditions. Okay, so uh, the central part of this would be uh, a component that monitors the communication channel and predicts the behavior of the communication channel to to try and predict if the communication channel is going to worsen or it's going to improve uh, in quality. So based on this, we are able to adjust our communication parameters so that we can maximize certain objectives, okay, such as maximize the throughput, maximize the reliability, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is kind of right. So it's basically a, um, uh, a feedback loop between the, the channel and the communication uh, system. So, uh, so I'm going to talk now about the exact work that we're doing. So first of all, it's the work that is led by Asanta, which is um, uh, looking at the, the use of polar uh, channel codes for industrial communication. So the polar codes are a uh, group of um, information uh, encoding. So it's an information encoding scheme. Um, and they are um, they they were the first um, uh, they were the first of their kind to actually be able to reach channel capacity. Okay, so they can actually use all of the channel uh, capacity. But this is only when so this is in theory and only when the um, uh, the amount of information that is encoded is of infinite length. Okay, so only then the polar codes are reaching the channel capacity. Okay. Now, in practice, these codes actually struggle with short uh, bits of information, short amounts of information. And unfortunately, in industrial environments, we are working with short uh, blocks of information because we want to reduce the communication uh, latency. OK, so, you know, there's different ways to improve the performance by using uh, different classes of decoders, by helping the decoding with, um, uh, with CRCs and so on and so forth. So Yasanta has been looking at these things. Now he's mostly been looking at how to um, uh, optimize the configuration of the polar codes for certain channel conditions. So he's developed this, uh, this channel simulator in MATLAB, right? That takes some information and encodes the information and modulates it, okay? And then passes it through a, uh, through a model of a wireless channel. And then at the end, it reverses the process, it demodulates, it decodes, and then it determines right how well the information has been decoded and how it, uh, it counts the uh, amount of errors. Um, so the first bit of work that, uh, that Yasanta did was to look at the, the performance of polar codes in industrial channels, okay? So, he looked at, um, um, uh, you know, at, uh, at, at a set of industrial channels that were uh, based on measured channels by the National Institutes of uh, Standards in, um, in the States. Uh, and he, um, he analyzed the, uh, the error rate of, uh, of the communication system that uses polar codes in different settings, okay? So if, uh, you know, there's mobility in the channel, uh, or if there's um, a certain amount of reflections in the channels and so on and so forth. And the, the, the most, uh, like the, the main thing that Yasanta was looking at was to look at the trade-off between reliability and latency, okay? So these two things are proportional, but well, you know, if we think about the way they work in, logically they're inversely proportional, okay? So if we increase the, um, uh, the reliability, if you want to increase the reliability, you will incur a negative impact in, in, uh, in time delays, okay? So you will, uh, you will increase, you will need to increase the latency. And if you want to reduce the latency, then you will actually uh, incur a negative, um, uh, a, a penalty in the reliability, right? And this is basically what he he's been looking at, right? To try to find the, the fact that there are these um, balance points, okay? Where you've got the optimum um, uh, combination of values for reliability and, um, and latency. Um, and next, once he identified that there's, you know, there's an optimal point, he started looking at uh, optimizing the communication, uh, the communication system. Um, and um, what he was looking at was this um, um, thing called cyclic prefix in one of the modulation techniques for uh, modulating information on the, uh, on, on the radio channel. Um, so um, the cyclic prefix is basically a bit of dead time, okay, it's a guard time that is used in order to prevent symbols, consecutive radio symbols from overlapping, okay? So because you've got, you know, signals that bounce off different uh, uh, paths throughout the environment, it's actually possible, you know, that you have the first time, you know, the first wave comes in, but then other waves comes in with certain delay, 
And if the communication is too fast, then one symbol could actually end up overlapping with the next symbol. And therefore this causes errors in decoding and so on, right? And this is what by introducing this guard time, you can actually prevent these kind of delays. But the problem is that if you're introducing the guard time, you are reducing the, uh, the throughput, right? So then Yasanta was looking at how to reduce this, this uh, guard time in a controlled fashion and what impact it has on the resulting reliability, right? So he looked again and he tried to uh, optimize the system in order to minimize the communication latency while maintaining the reliability um, uh, at, a certain, at a certain value, okay? So then he, he also is going to look at some theoretical bounds for polar codes, and then he's going to look at how to tune the communication system, when to tune it, right? So how much does the channel, how much do the channels change be, before we actually start uh, changing, uh, retuning the co uh, communication system, okay? I'm gonna try and speed up a bit because I see that I'm running out of time. It's about two minutes. Two minutes, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so the next work uh, will be led by Tabinda, and this is about uh, using spatial diversity to mitigate um, link blockages, okay? so. Um, so again, spatial diversity is the use of distinct paths between transmitters and receivers, okay? So um, the idea is that the different paths are, are not related, okay? And then the probability of the two paths being blocked at the same time by a certain obstacle is, uh, is, is low, okay? So based on that, we can actually determine how to, uh, how to send the, uh, the transmission. So there's different ways to do this. You can either use a single, um, a single transmitter and multiple coordinated receivers, and this is known as coordinated multipoint, and it's implemented in mobile networks. And then we've got uh, a single user and one receiver and multiple relays, or you've got multiple users and one or more or more receivers. And this is known as distributed MIMO. So, you know, these are the techniques that you will be uh, exploring. Obviously, this is just at the start. But what's in interesting here is the, uh, the, the issues, right? So in order to implement this, you have to have very good synchronization and timing accuracy between the, the, the devices, between the transmitters, okay? So you need to make sure that the transmitters all transmit at the same time, that they are well synchronized and so on and so forth, right? So uh, also reconfiguring the system uh, needs to be very fast, okay? So if you're, if you're optimizing this, the, whatever solution, whatever algorithm needs to be very, very quick. So these, these are the kind of issues that you will be looking at. And finally, it's the work led by Alvaro for channel estimation and prediction. So, um, so here, what, um, what Alvaro is looking at is basically how to understand what's going to happen, what is happening in the channel, and what might be happening in the future. So just to, you know, like a very simple example of what, what happens when we transmit information. So if we have a free space communication between two devices, then the received uh, signal, the received say, radio signal is very clean, okay? So there's very little variation in it. Now, if obviously this is a theory, this is an ideal scenario, but if we actually have an enclosed environment and we have obstacles, then the radio signal starts bouncing off of many things. And then the, the different components come in and then they are overlapped, okay? And they start creating uh, changes in the received um, uh, power, in the, receive, in the amplitude of the received signal. And we actually get something like this, okay? So this is actually a stochastic, uh, a stochastic uh, signal, okay? And uh, they are characterized with probability distributions, okay? Now, the thing is that most of the times the environments are considered unpredictable, but the reality is that industrial environments are actually quite predictable if you think about it, because they are, you know, they are always under a schedule, they need to be optimized, okay? Everything is scheduled. There's batch control, there's synchronization. There's very few things that are actually random inside an industrial uh, environment. Now, I've, you know, I've had people tell me, you know, that you've got warehouses and so on, uh, you know, where things are a bit different, but, you know, in factory automation pipelines, you know, our hypothesis is that it's, it's a bit more structured. So we want to actually use this in order to schedule the communication. And this is basically how we think this might work. So let's say that we have this example, the two robots are communicating and we have a forklift, okay? At the start, everything is fine. And we have a configuration that maximizes throughput with no spatial diversity, okay? And then we know that the, the forklift is going to travel between the path between the path between these two robots okay so let's say that we have no prediction of the channel okay so if when the forklift forklift actually breaks the connection we get one of these channel outages okay where the communication is stopped now it depends on how long this will happen of course because this is 
you know, a period of time when the communication stops. Now, of course, the channel monitor will notice that the communication has gone down and it will be able to update the configuration and it'll probably switch to something with very high robustness and minimum throughput, okay? Now, if we actually knew, right, for some something like a manufacturing execution system that um, the forklift, forklift will be actually traveling on this particular path, then the channel monitoring system would be able to actually plan ahead and maybe resort to using diversity, which would have a, um, a penalty in the throughput, but then that would, or would, would still result in less loss of communication than it was, uh, it was before, okay? So at the moment with Alvaro, we're looking at um, estimation of channel, uh, channel parameters. Um, so we're trying to figure out exactly how to predict this. There's different methods that we're looking at, some statistical methods and some, uh, some other types of methods. And we're, look, we're look using these public data sets. Um, and then for the future, we want to look at the use of millimeter wave communication, okay? And why this is exciting is that they have very high data rates comparable to optical fibers. The links are very directional, okay? So they're similar in behavior to wires. Uh, and because they're so directional, they are actually, their behavior in, in case of blockages is similar to, is pretty much binary, okay? So you either have the link or you don't, okay? Which is, it's not the case with more omnidirectional links, with omnidirectional links where you've got, you know, intermediate states and so on, okay? So there's different things that we're looking at, okay? So that's it. Thanks very much. Thanks for that, Victor. Okay, we have time for one question because he's got one minute of the Q&A allowed. So, any questions? Feel free to speak. Okay. There's nothing coming from there. Um, one quick one then, uh, Victor. So like, earlier on you said that the, you're looking for this to achieve a one, one per billion error rate. Yes. What's the current error rate? Or how, how close to that are we? Are? Well, it depends. I mean, you have some some solutions in the state of the art that are getting to uh, you know um, uh, to one per one per ten million, one per hundred million, right? So there are solutions, yeah, that are getting getting around that uh, that that area. And, and the significance of that error rate? I mean, uh, the significance. Yeah. Uh, like well. Well, it's it's just it's in the way that it affects the the control um, uh, the control algorithms that are working on top of the application. So, uh, you know, basically what we're trying to do is to make the communication system uh, reliable enough that the control algorithms don't need to change. Now, there are um, approaches that perform co-design of the control protocol, sorry, of the control algorithms with the communication protocol, right? So you can design control algorithms that basically have tolerance to uh, un unreliability and uncertainty in the, in the communication um, uh, system. So that's okay. also another avenue to, uh, to explore.